Okay. Wow, that's loud. <laughs> check, check. How's the sound, Sergey? Is it good? All right. I usually like to start my programs. I gotta hold this away from myself. I usually like to start on time. Uh, maybe just give a few minutes in case anybody went to the other location. They they move the location. Uh, but we'll get started pretty soon. I don't like to run late. But this program is going to be kind of a uh, retrospective, I guess, over the last uh, 20 plus years when I've been here with the World War II Center. I'm, I'm, my name is Mark Bonagora. I'm also a professor in the English department. And um, since really, since the day I started here at Brookdale, I was uh, part of the World War II Center, and then I was uh, took over as director maybe about 10 years ago. So this is gonna be a little bit of a retrospective. Um, I wonder if I even need this mic well, all right. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of a retrospective, and the theme is that I have, oh, sorry. Here, I'll get, put this over here, get rid of this too. The theme is that I have, um, I had four individuals in my life. Uh, I was very close to all of them in different ways, and they were all affected by World War II. Uh, two of them were combat veterans, and um, one of them uh, was a Japanese-American uh, survivor of an internment camp. And the other was a uh, Hungarian-born um, man who was, uh, who was put into Auschwitz and uh, Dachau when he was 14 years old. So I have a kind of a mixture of different people. I guess I can turn the music off. I have a mixture of different people, and I think that, um, that it's, it's interesting when I, when you look back over everything. So let me see if I can get this all running here, and I think we can get started. Is it six o'clock yet? This clock is not right. Okay. All right, I'm gonna start then. People will find their way. All right, so welcome to the, um, maybe one of my last programs. Um, I won't be director next year, so, but I may still be helping out. You know, they're not gonna be able to get rid of me that easy. Um, so anyway, this is basically what I learned from World War II. And so the first thing that I would say is to thank all the volunteers and the presenters and the people who helped out with the center over the past 20 years. And I don't think too many of them are here tonight, but there's so many people who volunteered their time and they uh, were just helping out, all, you know, because it takes a lot of people to put these programs together. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, we couldn't make it work without all them. So there's been so many people. And um, we have a, a fairly small budget. And so many of our presenters over the years came here. And they basically were giving out of their own, you know, doing it out of the goodness of their own hearts and coming here and traveling on their own expense. And so they really make it, make, made it work. Uh, so some of the programs I did over the long time, there's so many, I was trying to think of some of the ones that were most interesting to me. Uh, I did one program on um, J.D. Salinger's war experiences and, and a lot of people maybe who've read some of his work like, of course, The Catcher in the Rye and Nine Stories and Franny and Zoe and all the other books, uh, don't know that the centerpiece of his whole literary career, his whole life, in fact, was the war. Uh, he, was on D he was in D-Day. He fought his way across Europe. He was, uh, he was an intelligence officer, and he even stayed in Germany after the war, and he was interrogating Nazis uh, to find out I, I, if they were... Uh, redeemable, I guess, is the word. I don't know what the word is. Were they supposed to go to the Nuremberg trials or were they going to go back to life in Germany? That was his job. Um, and Kenneth Slowenski, who was the author of this best-selling book, he is just one of those people. He agreed to come to Brookdale 
for free and just, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'd love to talk about J.D. Salinger's war experiences. And I had another uh, student of mine uh, who was a Marine in Iraq, Matt Craw. He, he, he was at this event too. And also a good friend of mine, uh, Charles Johnson, who was a poet laureate of New Jersey. And he was a Vietnam vet. So they all kind of fit in. They're all writers and they all kind of fit into the theme. Um, but it's very interesting. And if you ever do read The Catcher in the Rye or you reread it or if you ever read it, 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 everybody thinks it's a story of just a disaffected teenager who has trauma over losing his brother. You know, his brother died. But it's really about a, a guy who's been to war. And Salinger had the book with him all throughout the war. And in fact, in between battles, <laughs> they would stop whatever by the side of the road or whatever. He'd set up his little typewriter there and he'd start working on The Catcher in the Rye. So it was a book that literally went through the whole war with him. And um, if you're interested, this is a great book to read. I think it's the best book about Salinger. Uh, so I won't stay too long on any one slide, but um, it's a very interesting story. And he actually married a German woman who was, her family were Nazis uh, right after the war. And of course, you're not even supposed to fraternize, you know, you're not supposed to date them or whatever. And um, he brought her home to meet his Jewish family in, in New York. And you can imagine that that didn't go very well. And it was a very short marriage. Um, but that just, there's so many stories with J.D. Salinger and the war. It's incredible. So I would strongly recommend check out that book. You'll love it. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, but most people don't think of Salinger. They don't think of the war. Um, uh, this was another really great program that we did. Um, the New Jersey Women of World War II with Patricia Cipine. She wrote this book. And... It was interesting. I had interviewed some people who, uh, some women who worked in the hospitals here and did a lot of things during World War II. That was one of a very, very memorable program we did. Um, and this was a program where Marissa Fox came in and she was, she's working on a film. I think then it was called By a Thread, if you can see in the little corner there. But it's, it's since been changed to My Underground Mother. And this was another one of the incredible programs that we did where um, Marisa, I think, was f she found out after her mother had died, her mother had this secret past history. And she was actually a teenager, and she was in a, like a, a labor camp of the Nazis. And she never, Marisa never learned all that until after her mother died. And she went on a quest, um, which is not unlike the quest that I went on probably for the last 35 years or 40 years to find out what happened to my father, you know, after he, he'd been, he had died. So I couldn't ask him, but I had to go around the, you know, go around the world to try to find out. And that's what she did. She literally went around the world. She found women who were in this camp with her mother uh, and they were all teenagers at the time. And there's so many incredible stories about that. So look out for that film. It's called My Underground Mother. I don't believe it's out yet, but it will probably be out soon. Um, and so that was, that was an incredible program. We had her come back twice. Um, that's something very memorable. This was a program I did on pe people who were children during World War II. So uh, from left to right, there's Maureen. She was from England, and Asia was from Latvia, and Haida was from Germany, and Mika was from Holland. And so they did a program that was really great, and they talked about their childhood. And, they, they, of course, the interesting thing is there was someone from Germany, and she had become best friends with a woman from Holland. Uh, and, of course, they were just little children during the war. But, um, you know, that was, that was one of the more interesting aspects, that they developed a friendship over the years um, that was, of course, way beyond the politics or anything else that was going on. But I mean, there, there were so many programs, I couldn't really list them all. This was the longest walk, and that's Paul Zygo in the picture. And Paul was the first director and founder of the World War II Center. Um, so he was the one who brought me on board. And um, 
among his many specialties of history, uh, he was a history professor here at Brookdale for many years, was, was D-Day. And this program featured this gentleman, John Santillo, who was a local guy from Bricktown, I think. There, there he was back during the war, and there he was just a couple years ago. Um, and he was 96 years old in this picture, um, and he was still driving. He was in great shape, uh, and he gave us a real talk about D-Day and Normandy, and uh, I like that picture because Paul's in the background and John is in, in the front. And John, uh, he was just this, well, it seemed like all the, the people that I met who survived a long life after the war, they had these amazing personalities, you know, just like no matter what was going on, they were going to make, make a positive spin on it and always smiling and laughing. So he, he went over to Normandy um, with, um, with a group from Brookdale just a couple years ago for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And um, uh, uh, Professor Elena Maloney was from my department. She went there with them. And John, John comes back and he says, uh, I don't know what to do. All the, the girls, the women were kissing me and everybody was hugging me. And I said, just don't tell my wife, you know, when he, when he comes back. He, he just was, was always cracking jokes. Uh, but he, he said he wanted to go back to Normandy for his 100th birthday. In fact, the, the people over there were inviting him back. Uh, he didn't quite make it, I'm sorry to say, but uh, I really thought he was going to make it. I thought he was going to have his 100th birthday party over there in Normandy, but of course, uh, in, in France, among many places, they really remember the war. You know, we, we have a special World War II center here, but over there, it's part of their life, and they never forgot uh, what we did. So when people like John would go back, I mean, they were like heroes, you know. They just couldn't do enough for them. Um, so, but he was really, uh, really an incredible person. I mean, that's sort of a theme of this whole thing, really this whole 25 years, is I got to meet so many people who I probably would never have gotten to meet, and they were just, like, amazing. So... Uh, this was a book that Matthew Craw wrote. He was one of my creative writing students, and he was a Marine who uh, was in Operation Iraqi Freedom. So that was his first book uh, that, that came out uh, that he started in my class. And we did a couple programs with him as well. And that was certainly a highlight. So in this picture, you can see that Matt is kind of in the middle with the beard and then next to him is another young guy, Angel Quiles. He, he was also a Marine from, from that campaign. And they're shaking hands with uh, Stan Hoffman, who was a World War II veteran. Uh, and um, behind Angel is George Wapol. And George, we have Wapol's corner out in the library with the rocking chairs there and all his, some of his stuff from the wars there. And next to him is Gene Snyder, who was in the English department. He, he was a Vietnam vet. And uh, Dr. Laura Neitzel is to his uh, left, I guess, left or right. And, um, and um, there I am on the, the end, and Mr. Coburn is there. Uh, he was also a big part of our center. And the, the great thing about this program was that the theme was veterans of many different wars getting together. And the theme was coming home, and they told stories about uh, when they came home from the war. And that, that might have been maybe my favorite program of all time because I really liked getting the multi-generational panel together. That's something that we probably don't do all that much and not enough of because the older guys, especially Stan, he, he was always full of wisdom and advice and trying to help the young guys out and tell them, you know, what you need to do and how to, how to heal yourself. And it just, it was an amazing program. And that, that's probably one of my favorites, I think. Um, and uh, I, have an, I have an interview with Stan on my website, if you ever want to go to it. He was a very, very unique person. And he talked about how he used yoga to help him heal from the war. So you wouldn't think of, like, World War II vets are doing yoga like in the 1950s 
in the 60s, but, but he was. And he talks a lot about that. And so uh, just, you know, very interesting people that, uh, that I would never probably get to ever hang out with. Um, so that was a big favorite program of mine. And then this was probably the first big program when I first started here. And if you look in that picture, next to me is my mom in the red, uh, red top there. And then there's all the, and, and you see jo uh, Joanna Coburn was our vice president at the time. She's all the way on the far side of the picture with the gray turtleneck and the black, uh, black uh, blazer or whatever. Um, and the rest of them are all Marines from the Guadalcanal campaign. And that was where my dad was during the war. But my dad died, you know, a long time ago, and I didn't really get to, I'll tell you that story in a minute, but I didn't really get to that. To, to understand what he did. So um, this was the first time I got these, these all Guadalcanal veterans together. There's, um, uh, let's see, um, all the way on the one side with the flag, that's John Seti Ducati. And then you can kind of see Jerry Federico. He's a little bit hidden in the back. And then there's, um, Ralph Weinstein and Sam Stan Stanislaw. Um, and some of these people, they knew each other, but they hadn't been together in 50 years. So that was a really special program. That was one of the first programs I ever did, and it was really, uh, it was really amazing. You know, it was really amazing to get them together. And a lot of them didn't want to talk very much. Or they said, you know, Jerry, especially in the back, they said, I'm not saying a word. I don't know why you're inviting me. And then he, I couldn't get the microphone out of his hand. He was talking the whole time. And uh, Jerry's wife uh, told me the same thing. She said, he, he hadn't spoken about the war ever. And although he still had nightmares, even well into his late 70s there, he was still having nightmares waking up, but he never spoke about it. She said, that's the first he ever spoke about the war in all this time. Um, so that was part of the work I did. So I mentioned my dad. There he is there. And he was uh, in the Marines from 1940 to 1945. And he was a Marine Raider. And he fought uh, two, two islands. He was in, at Guadalcanal and Bougainville. And he had um, really lifelong disabilities after the war, including uh, brain injury, PTSD, and malaria. But the brain injury was one that we didn't really know much about. And that's probably why all of this research even ever started in the first place. Because when I grew up, um, I wasn't that interested in it. I knew he had done something and, you know, but... Um, except for a very brief time when I was a teenager. I, when I was a teenager, I was a little bit interested. And he had a book called The Old Breed, which is about the Marines before, uh, before Pearl Harbor. Um, and I used to read that book when I was a kid, and I was sort of mesmerized by it. Um, and when I was like 16, I thought, you know, maybe I should join the Marines. Now, if you know me, and anybody who knows me, I'm like the farthest thing from a Marine you could ever find on planet Earth, right? Um, uh, my students think I'm an old hippie from Woodstock or something, but I'm not that old. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't at Woodstock. But, but that one, for that one summer, I was very interested. And so I, I, I filled out a little card. You know, when you're in high school, the guidance counselor has these cards. And yeah, I'm interested in the Marines. And here's my address. And so one day... <laughs> One day, these Marines came to the house at 7 in the morning, and, dad, and my, dad's, my dad was going to play golf. It was in the summer, and he's like, well, who, who's knocking on the door? Who, who's out there? And I said, oh, Dad, no, don't worry about it. Just a couple Marines, they want to talk to me. And he said, a couple Marines want to talk to you? He said, can I, can I sit in on it? I said, sure, sure. So to make a long story short, my dad's talking to me. He's like, well, if my son goes into the military, he's going to graduate college first. And then maybe he'll go in as an officer. But, but I thank you for coming over. And he had a beer with them at 8 in the morning. They had a beer. And he said, yeah, I was in the Marines, too. I was at Guadalcanal. I was a raider. And then they were just like, oh, OK. Uh, have a nice day, sir. And they just they left real fast. But that was my brief encounter. But 
Uh, after that, I wasn't that interested. I honestly, it just wasn't, didn't seem to me what's so interesting about World War II, right? Which is funny for me to say that. Um, but I wasn't that interested. But, but the thing was, my dad died at, in his 60s. And uh, there, there he was uh, when he had just signed up. Uh, he was about 17 years old there before the war. Um, and, but he died and he had these disabilities and we never really knew the whole story, right? So my mom was someone who was, well, she was upset, obviously. She, she was, they were married for like 40 years and, you know, they were t together a long time. So she was obviously sad, but she was angry too. And so she, we went on a quest and she just enlisted me. There wasn't anything I could do, but it was actually, it was kind of fun, honestly. But we started to research because she, she wanted to find out what happened to him. And we got his medical records. We got all his service records. And we, we were doing research for years and years and years. And um, eventually, she actually got a pension from the Veterans Administration, which is not that easy to do after someone's passed away. But she learned, we learned how to connect up these injuries and disabilities and and it was certainly due to her. And, and, it, and she wound up helping other women whose husbands had passed away. She helped them get pensions, too. So, I mean, when my mom did something, you know, she didn't do it, you know, half-assed. She was like, we're going to do something. We're going to do it right. And it was actually, the funny thing is, is I, I loved, like, I had graduated already, and I, I, I had a master's degree. I, I knew my way around a college library. And it was actually fun. I loved going with my mom. I took her. We went to the Rutgers Library, and we were looking up all this medical stuff to prepare a case. And, and it, was, it was actually really fun, you know? Like, we just, we had, it sounds weird to say that, but, but it was just fun being together with her and, 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 you know, trying to just help her, you know, find out. Because my mom was very, she liked justice. She didn't like injustice in the world, no matter what it was. So she was going to find out what happened. What happened to my husband? Why was he the way he was? Why did he die so young? And we, we dug through his records. And this was something, again, we just stumbled upon this very late. But he had a lot of brain injuries, concussions. And if you see in this little blurb, unconscious 72 hours, uh, he was riding in an ambulance at Guadalcanal when it was raining, lost control, of wheel, ran off a cliff. Um, and you see this was treated for cerebral concussion. Um, and um, that's when we started to, to find out. But they didn't know the extent of what brain injury meant in those days. They called it intracranial injury, as you can see. And then the next one, we see more of his records, intracranial injuries, what they're calling it. Um, and it says... Uh, you know, unfit for service, probable future duration, permanent recommendation that he be discharged from the Marine Corps. So that was, you know, way back in, in 1944, um, you know, they knew that this was a serious injury, but we really didn't know the extent of it and things like CTE and concussions and all that that we're aware of today, we weren't really aware of back then. Um, but this was something, like, my mom was really ahead of her time because she was said, I know that, that, that this affected his brain. I know that a lot of things that happened to him in life and decisions that he made didn't make any sense. And, and that, that, that is a part of brain injury that, that, that I think we still don't really understand. Um, but so that, that's what started me on this whole quest. So the first... Marine I met from Guadalcanal was named Bob Worthington. And what my mom had done simultaneously during this time, she, uh, she put some ad in a, a, a magazine. I don't know if it was a Marine Corps magazine or something. Maybe it was Leatherneck magazine. I don't know. And she said, if there are any Marines who were with my husband on Guadalcanal, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like you to tell me what were his experiences. And Bob was, she got a stack of letters, by the way. She got a stack. Um, and and they're, they're incredible to read. But Bob was one who kind of stood out from the crowd. And um, he actually invited my mom out to where he lived. He lived in Coos Bay, Oregon. And um, 
My mom went out there a couple times to meet him, and eventually, I have Bob to thank for all of this, <laughs> probably for me getting my job and everything else that happened. Bob would not leave me alone, because my mom would say on the phone, you know, in those days we didn't have cell phones, we had like the phone in the wall with the wire, and she's sitting there. She says, oh, Bob wants to talk to you, Mark. I'm like, why does he want to talk to me? It's like, he wants to talk, I told him you're a writer. I told him you're a writer, he wants to talk to you. So eventually, Bob and I struck up a conversations and um, friendship, and he said, you know, basically, you're going to write my book. I want to write a book about my life, and you're going to do it. And, and so he kind of sucked me into the whole thing, and Bob had, I, I just loved him. I can't even tell you. He was such a unique person. He was just very, very, uh, unique is the best word, uh, because he had been through so much, and, um, you know, he didn't want to die without telling his story to someone. And I was the one he picked. So I made a couple trips out to Coos Bay, and Bob would sit there and dictate his, his story to me, and I'd be writing it down. And, and, and eventually we come up with a, a book called The Tiger is Dead, and it became a website that I did. And um, the book is on there, and also that's where I started to interview all the other uh, Marines and, and even some other people who weren't Marines, nurses, and, um, and I actually put the manuscript of the book that we wrote together um, up there. So let me see if I can get this on here. Let's see, how do I do this? I have to move it like that. Okay, so but now what do I do? Now I have to make this big. Okay, so the thing about Bob was that he, he really, he was another one, kind of like my mom in a way that I can see why they got along. He was also concerned with justice, and he felt like people don't know what veterans go through, and nobody's really telling the true story. And so he wanted to tell, he, he wanted to tell the dark side of everything. And he had led a very difficult life, even before the war, but especially after. So his stories were again and again about, you know, really difficult things. So here's just a little blurb, uh, and a little excerpt. Um, Bob was sent to Mare Island Naval Hospital in Vallejo, California. The first morning he was there, a Navy doctor and his corpsman came around rather early making sick rounds. Bob was sleeping and the doctor didn't want to wake him, so he put his hand lightly on Bob's wrist to feel for his pulse. With that, Bob sprang up, and before anyone could stop him, he had the doctor on the floor with his hands on his throat. The corpsmen were eventually able to restrain Bob after a few tense moments. As the doctor was putting himself back together, he said to Bob, you're a little nervous. Um, and this is Bob talking. I explained to him, nobody put their hands on you when you were asleep except the enemy just before killing you. It was the practice of the Japanese to come among us at night when we were in our foxholes. If we heard them crawling, we would say, who's there? We would get replies, replies like, it's me, Joe, I need a match. We would answer, okay, Joe, come and get it. We waited in the foxholes, ready with our knives. When they looked over, we would grab them, plunging our knives into them on the way down. If Joe had been an American, he would have whispered back Lollapalooza or Lulabelle, since the Japanese could not master the L sound, producing it as an R instead. So Bob was really kind of fascinated with telling those stories. Um, and he really wanted all the stuff to come out. And so the way it turned out, um, when Bob was getting near, near death, um, he, he was also wounded at Guadalcanal, but he never received a Purple Heart. So here's a picture of Bob getting his long overdue Purple Heart. Um, and the man presenting it to him is Colonel Mitchell Page, who was a Medal of Honor winner, I believe. Um, also on Guadalcanal. And so after all those years, Bob finally got his, his Purple Heart. And, and I think for him, telling me the story was also really like a redemptive thing for him. And he didn't really get to live much longer than that. I'm just trying to see if I can pull up one little story here. He didn't really get to live much more after that. But Getting his Purple Heart was a big deal to him, and he'd had a stroke only a few days before that. 
So he was, it was pretty, it didn't matter. He was determined. He said, I'm going to that ceremony. There's no way I'm not going. And, uh, and Bob was the one who really started me on all this. And he told me, here's some other guys you should interview and you should get the whole thing going. So what started out as just talking to him over the phone and visiting him, uh, I started to interview other Marines. And I, then I started to work for the Library of Congress and building up my website. And it just, it just went on and on and on. And, and it's really because of him. Uh, so that was, that was really something that was, uh, was pretty important to me. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to get to one other little part here. Um, let's see if I can find this real quick. We'll do this. Um, 210 maybe. Yeah, so this was kind of a big deal where he was when he got his Purple Heart. And so... Uh, they have a little newspaper there, and this was a story that came from the newspaper 57 years ago on a remote Pacific island. Robert Worthington, then a young Marine Corps private, was wounded in the line of duty. Normally, Worthington would have been awarded a Purple Heart, but it was 1942, and Worthington was on Guadalcanal where nothing was normal. Worthington survived the battle, but he never got his medal. But this June, thanks to the testimony of Medal of Honor winner, Worthington will finally receive his decoration. And... Um, in 1942, Worthington was one of the first, was one of the men of the 1st Marine Division um, who landed on Guadalcanal. It should be August 7th. I don't know if that was my mistake or theirs. Um, and um, let me just move ahead a little bit. Bob said, if you were wounded like me, they just patched you up and you went back out. No medals were, were awarded for being wounded in action. At that time, Purple Hearts were only awarded to men so badly wounded they had to be evacuated. Although he received other minor wounds in the following months, Worthington managed to live through the fighting. Um, and then he says, uh, we were deprived of sleep. We had malaria. We had no emotions left except anger. That's what sustained us in battle. Uh, however, the strain of combat has left him suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. He also developed a serious heart condition, which doctors told him is terminal, which he attributes in part to the strain of the battle. Um, and and um, Bob had met a doctor out in Oregon whose name was uh, Clarence Carnahan. He was at the VA, and he was a, a really amazing doctor, and he was the one who kind of helped Bob in the last years of his life. And he had, Dr. Carnahan had always worked with the most uh, severely uh, wounded, mostly from Vietnam. And I had a, there's a lot in the book. I, you know, if you want to see the book, it's on my website and you can, you can look at it for free. But uh, Dr. Carnahan gave me a long interview. And he said, if you want to help veterans, the best way to help them is simply to listen without judgment and just let them tell their stories. And so, um, that's what he did for Bob, and, uh, you know, I think Bob had some closure at the end of his life, but um, he had just, he had been through a, a really crazy life, if you, if, again, if you read the book, um, but he was self-medicating for many years, and uh, he just had a very, very rough time of it, but he was like nobody I ever met. He was so, uh, so brilliant, and he never went to college. I don't, he only graduated eighth grade, actually, uh, and didn't even go to high school. But he was one of the most brilliant people I ever met. I loved just sitting and having him tell me stories about everything. And um, uh, it was just one of the best things I ever did was getting to know Bob. So, um, yeah, wherever you are, Bob, if you can hear me, I hope you know that I really thank you uh, for taking me into your life a little bit. So then, while I was doing that Tiger is Dead theme book and website, uh, I happened to be in New York one day. I think I was down in the village somewhere, and I, I, I was in a restaurant, and uh, I saw somebody had a picture of a tiger, and, and it was a really interesting picture, and I said, hey, where'd you get that picture? I, that's really, I like that. You know, I'm doing a website called The Tiger is Dead. I would love to have a picture of a tiger like that, a painting. And he said, oh, there's this... This old homeless guy down on 6th Avenue, if you go down to this corner, you'll see him out there. 
he's the one. He does these paintings of tigers, and he'll probably, you know, if he, he'll make one for you if you, get, you talk to him. Um, so that, that guy was Jimmy Miracatani, and at that time when I met him, this was around 2000, the year 2000, he was homeless, living on the streets of New York, and doing his artwork. And, you know, me being kind of the way I was back then, uh, I would just hang out with Jimmy and stay all night with him and talk to him and, you know, buy him coffee or tea or whatever he wanted. And, and he would tell me stories too. And he told me the most wild stories, all these things. And, I, and, and, and the funny thing was at the time I was in New York, I was also going to a therapist in New York and I would tell her sometimes, you know, what did you do last night? And I would, I would tell her. And, she, and I said, I met this guy, Jimmy Mirakatani. He's a really interesting guy. He was an artist from Japan. And, and she says, Jimmy Mirakatani, where'd you meet this guy? Oh, he's a, he's a homeless guy. He's a homeless guy. You're like, okay, Mark, you're, you're hanging out all night with homeless guys. Okay, that sounds like a, a plan. Um, but... I told her, I believe everything he tells me. I believe it. I don't think he's making this stuff up. I think this, I think it's everything is true. And so, you know, it kind of went on, and that was right before um, before 9-11. And this was right in the neighborhood, right near the trade, not too far from the, the that neighborhood. So after 9-11 happened, I didn't know what happened to anyone. Everything was was different. And what I found out was that um, I was teaching a class maybe about 10 years later, and I was talking about Jimmy, and one of my students says, oh, Jimmy Miracatani? Yeah, I just saw a movie about him. He's the guy who draws the cats. And I said, what? You saw a movie about him? Where did you see a movie? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, there's this movie, The Cats of Miracatani. And I said, you, and, and so it turns out everything he told me was exactly true. And he had been a, he was uh, born in Japan, but he had dual citizenship. He lived in the United States during the war. He was a teenager. And he was sent to an internment camp uh, in Tool Lake in California. And later on, only after all that, I, I found that there was a film about him called The Cats of Miracatani, which I think you can stream it. And it's all about his story of how he, uh, was put in the internment camp and how he lost his citizenship. He renounced his citizenship. At a certain point, they said to them, hey, do you guys want to get out of here? Just sign these papers and we'll, we'll get, we'll, you, can, you can leave. And there was the papers were renouncing your citizenship. Did you have a? I, I know the short of the time. Okay. Actually, I have this wrong. Yeah, Jimmy was born in Sacramento. He was born in Sacramento. I have that. You just said that it struck a chord. He wasn't born in Japan, but I believe he Jimmy had studied art in Japan, and then he came back to the country. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stories like that. But Jimmy had told me these stories. We're sitting around freezing to death. You know, it's New York in the winter time, in the middle of the night, and and he's telling me these stories. I'm th I'm thinking, how is this guy alive? you know, with all he went through. And to even be, like, in your 70s and be homeless in New York, I mean, this is a strong, strong person. But all these stories, that's the tiger that he drew for me that I put on my website, and I still have it. Um, but that was his, his signature tiger. That was his, his work of art there. But he would do cats for anyone who would come by. If you just, if you just came by and you talked to him and you said you wanted a he would do a, a cat drawing for you. Um, but all the stuff, I never learned what happened to him until after the film came out. Uh, there's another one of his cats, a similar theme. And his paintings now are in mu museums, and they're all over the country. I mean, he, he, he's really become uh, famous. He, he always told me he would. Uh, there's another one of his cats. And often he would be... He would have a paper, and he'd have, like, colored pencils or pens, and he was doing this, again, in the wintertime when I was with him. So, you know, your fingers are freezing. He's, he's drawing. I mean, he was just, he was just an amazing, amazingly strong person. 
Uh, there's another one of his cats. Um, and so um, the film came out. Here's just a little clip, just a minute or so. Um, but this kind of told the whole story, which I didn't realize. Um, I didn't realize, but I did believe him. You know, I believed him, even if, you know, it sounded, all the stories he told me sounded so crazy, but they weren't. So that was um, what happened here. What's my technology failing me or something? Oh, there we go. Uh, well, I'll get to Leslie in a second. Let me go back to uh, Jimmy for a second. So um, you can't really see it there, but he's just down the street from the World Trade Center. And when the Trade Center was attacked, he was literally still there working on his art. He didn't even get up. So if you can imagine that, the whole world is coming to an end right around him, and he's literally sitting at that table. He's still working. He, didn't even, he barely even looked up. And he was so dedicated to his art. That's how he was able to do it when he was homeless. That's how he was able to keep his life together because he had given up his citizenship um, you know, when he was in his teens, and so he had no life. I mean, he had no, <clears throat> never, never really had a job. He, he was, he was basically like a person without a country, and uh, he had a very interesting life. He worked for Jackson Pollock, the artist. Um, he was his chef, and he did a lot of other things, but eventually he wound up being homeless because the guy he was working for at the time died, and so he had to leave. He was living on Park Avenue. He was working for somebody as a driver. But um, so that's how he wound up homeless. But it, the story has a nice ending because the director of the film, uh, a woman named Linda Hattendorf, she took Jimmy in to her apartment after 9-11. And she looked up. She's the one who found all these documents. And she, she, she got him. He, he got Social Security in the end. He got a place, a nice apartment to live in. He really had a lot, of clo a lot of good things happen to him in the last years of his life. And he just, he came into his apartment. It was, the walls were all white, empty. And after a very short time, it was filled with his artwork. And his cats were everywhere. And it was just, it, it really was beautiful what happened to him um, at the end. He, he, he didn't, it was a fight for her because he didn't want to accept anything from the government. Uh, he always hated the government his whole life, and she said, no, you, have, you can get money, and you can get a place to live, and he said, I don't want anything from them, I'm fine. Uh, so it really was lifelong, you know, injuries, what happened to him from being in those internment camps, um, and, you know, he was just an artist. He had nothing to do with the war at all, um, but 
he was another one who was really important to me. Um, and then the last one who came into my life was Leslie Schwartz. And Leslie was the one who kind of completed the whole thing because uh, as I've explained with the other people, I knew there were varying degrees of, you know, I, I don't know if the word closure, that's not really a good word, but I say healing or, you know, finding peace maybe. There were varying degrees of that. But when I met Leslie, I met him in 2009 at Brookdale. He came to Brookdale to give a little talk and... Um, the next day I wrote a little story about him for my blog and somehow he found that somebody showed him the story and he called me up the next day and we talked every day for like 10 years. He called me two, three times a day and um, he was known all over the world for his education so he was particularly well known for speaking to German students about the Holocaust and uh, he also spoke to thousands of students all over the world Two major films were based on his life. One was a documentary, and one was a feature film. Um, the feature film came out a couple years ago. I think it was called, um, I'll have to think of it now. I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, I'll think of it. But Hal Linden played Leslie in the film. Um, it was quite good. But um, we had press coverage all over the world. And we never had an agent. We never had, you know, press people. We did, everything we did was all organic. They would find out what we were doing. We were in the New York Times. We were on Fox News. We were on ABC News all over Germany. Um, because the interesting thing about Leslie was how he had found uh, healing. And for him, the way he found healing, um, which is a pretty good way, is to help others. So you wouldn't think that a, a survivor like himself, his whole family was killed in Auschwitz, and he managed to escape and get to Dachau, and he was put in work camps. But you wouldn't think somebody like that would want to do anything nice. Nice isn't the right word. But why would he want to help Germany, right? Um, and in fact, a lot of survivors, if you just mention anything German to them, you know, uh, kind of like uh, some of the Marines I knew from Guadalcanal, if you ma mention anything Japanese to them, they never got over it. They wouldn't even eat rice, you know, or anything like that. I mean, it was, wouldn't drive a Japanese car. So you could imagine, um, and Leslie even had a lifelong friend, uh, a woman who he would uh, spend a lot of time with. She lived in Brooklyn. He lived in Manhattan. And uh, she had been a partisan during the war, so she was actually fighting the Nazis with her mother, uh, part of the, the, the partisans of Vilna. And Leslie and, and her name was Helena, Helena Kusten Jagendorf. And Leslie and Helena had a, you know, a lifelong friendship. He would see her almost every day when he was in New York, and he never was able to tell her <laughs> that he goes back to Germany in the summer because he also had a place in Florida, and he would go down to Florida. She said, I'm going to Florida. If, she, if he had told her that I go back to Germany, and I speak to German students, and I'm honored over there, she would have never talked to him, okay, because she, she had never even come close to having any kind of a, I, I don't know what the word is, a, a good feeling about anything German. But, but Leslie... He was determined to find healing. The way he did it was to go back to the scene of the crime. So he was, his whole life, he was obsessed with going back to Germany and w go back to the places where he was and to find the people who were there. And so he was really obsessed with this his whole life, basically. Um, and as I said, our friendship grew over the years, and I wrote a book with him, um, and... Um, it's just amazing. This gentleman in the picture with Leslie uh, is named Max Mannheimer, and he was known all throughout Germany and Europe. And he was doing what Leslie eventually came to do first for many years. Uh, and Max was known as the White Raven, and he was honored in countries all over Europe. But he was doing Holocaust education in Germany, too, uh, for a long, long time. And again, it's very, it's, they're not, it's not like they're the only two who ever did it, but it's very unusual. 
Um, and Leslie would go back to Dachau, and he was a greeter there, so he would meet people when they went to Dachau, and he would walk around with them and talk to them. And so Leslie had really found healing by going back and wanting to promote education. Um, I think there's a phone going off somewhere. Um, and that's the book that Leslie and I wrote together. And um, that picture of him, he's probably about 15 years old, maybe, or yeah, probably 15. And he's actually wearing the uniform of a Hitler youth. And the reason he's wearing that uniform is when he was liberated from, uh, fr he was actually in a subcamp of Dachau. Um, when he was liberated from the camp, he had, you know, he had no clothes, he had nothing. You know, he had uh, flimsy rags he was wearing, and he found this, this coat on the side of the road, and he put it on, and he said, you know, to himself, he said, I'm wearing this coat, but I'm not one of them. And um, you can see a little inscription down at the bottom, 1946, and he has his prisoner number. <clears throat> but that... That's the kind of person Leslie was. He was really, um, he, he was really going to survive because he felt like uh, there's a, I have to survive. I have to tell my story. I have to let someone know what happened. And um, you can't really tell in that picture. But he was shot in the face right at the end of the war by a um, by a Hitler youth. Um, but <clears throat> it's a little hard to tell. I, have a th I think that picture is a little bit retouched as well. I'm not sure because you really can't see the scar. But to his, for the rest of his life, he had a scar on his face. But right at the end of the war, he was uh, almost escaping the camp. And a Hitler youth saw him and chased him down and shot him in the back of the, the neck. And it went through his face. And um, <clears throat> that, that's a whole other story. But um, I have a little clip from... Uh, from a film, uh, from the documentary film. Uh, well, well, I'll get to this slide in a second. Um, but let's see, how can I get this this up? Um, yeah, there it is. So um, Bavarian Television made a film about Leslie, and it was about the last days of the war. And the interesting thing about the film and why it's perfect for Leslie is they go with German students today, German high school students, and they research everything that happened to Leslie. And the, the, the interesting thing, the crazy thing about Germany is you, you hear these names of these big camps, but there was hundreds, thousands of camps all over Germany. So it's like if we were in Germany, there'd be a camp out that way, and there'd be another one over there, all over the place. So the students never realized, right in their own backyard, right in the place where they walk every day, they didn't realize what was there. And so they were going with Leslie on a journey to find out the records and find out what happened to him. And that was how he really found healing, too, by helping them learn. So here's just a couple minutes of a clip from this film. It's called The Muldorf Train of Death by uh, Beatrice Sonhuter. And it was on Bavarian television for many years. In 1946, after his recovery, Leslie immigrated to relatives in the United States. Only now, at the age of 80, is he able to talk about his memories. I was especially affected by the closeness of this part of history. We've always thought about National Socialism as something being far away, something going on officially in Berlin.
So um, Leslie had, you know, worked with these German students, and he spoke to thousands of the students um, in schools all over Germany. Uh, and, and, you know, afterwards they would come up to him and they would hug him and they would cry with him. And as far as I know, uh, Germany is the only country in human history who perpetrated a genocide and then actually teaches about that genocide in their schools because I don't believe they do this in Japan, and uh, I've never heard of any other country actually teaching about what they did. So um, I think the, the, the idea is that they don't believe they can move forward as a country unless they face their past, um, which is a really, really interesting idea, you know? Um, I don't think we in America have ever faced what we did to the Native Americans um, I mean, in, and in Australia, I believe a couple years ago, there was an apology to the Aboriginal people, but it's very rare that a government or a country acknowledges what it did, and, and even rare, but in Germany, a lot of people like my age and a little younger, a little older teachers, and they really just took up this idea that we're not going to forget. We don't want to forget what happened. We don't want to excuse what happened. We want to face it. We want to teach it. We want to get the truth out because we can't ever be, you know, they, I mean, they consider themselves a world leader, leading nation now. We can never be a, 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 a world leading nation if we, if we hide this or we act like it didn't happen or, you know. So I could not believe the response that we got from so many people in Germany. So I have this slide where at, at the time, Chancellor Merkel came out to meet Leslie and thank him. She also m went to meet Max as well and thank him. But if you just think of this picture, right? Um, if I were to go back, yeah, there. So there's 15-year-old Leslie Schwartz, right? His whole family, his whole immediate family has been murdered in the concentration camps. He was, he should have been dead by all practical purposes. He was in slave labor. He was 75 pounds by the end of the war with typhus and shot and there's you know he should have been dead too but this country that tried to you know basically exterminate him by the time before his life was over the chancellor of the country is meeting him and thanking him and greeting him and we got such nice letters from chancellor merkel uh, where she was you know acknowledging what he did and i said now if that isn't healing then I don't know how anyone would ever define healing. Because if you would have said to that kid, um, someday you're gonna be honored in Germany, the chancellor is going to honor you for, for, for your help, you know. I mean, it's just, it, you couldn't make a story up like that. It's the craziest thing you'd ever, you'd ever hear. Um, and, and when I think about Leslie's whole life, the whole thing was, it's, it started, um, I wonder if I can show you this real quick from our book. It started when he um, had these experiences in the camp where German civilians were actually nice to him because he was so young. Why can't I find this? Let's see if we can find it. Um, now, that's not what I want, I don't think. What do I want? Page 40. Okay, so let's get to page 40. But it all started because when he was at this camp at Dachau, um, he happened to run into a couple of people, German civilians, who treated him, uh, treated him very nicely. And that's the really weird thing. Uh, let me see if I can find this. I need, it's a little hard to cue this up ahead of time. Okay, yeah, so here. Um, so if you want to read the whole book, you can read it, but he managed to escape from Auschwitz. If he had stayed at Auschwitz, he would have been killed because he was essentially a child. But he managed to sneak onto a work detail that was going to Dachau, 
And so he wound up with men. He was just a kid and a small kid at that. He wasn't big for his age. But here he's a little kid amongst men in a work camp outside of Dachau. So um, if you take it down a little bit later on, I had a good deal of freedom to move around the town. So I began looking for people who would give me food when I begged for it. Sometimes I was successful, but what I was soon to receive that summer was even greater than food. There were two Germans who made everlasting impressions on me during this time. Their kindness eclipsed much of the evil done to me by their countrymen. They also reinforced the idea that I should not put all Germans into the same category. One such person was Martin Fuss, the train station gatekeeper at Carlsfeld. He noticed me standing across the tracks from him one day and approached me. We struck up a friendship. He would often bring me liverwurst sandwiches and help keep up my spirits with his incredible kindness. Our meetings went on for months. Many years later, I discovered Fuss had a son my age. Perhaps that, that's why we bonded so closely. But didn't other Germans also have sons my age? What grace allows one person to open his eyes while others remain blind? Back then, I don't think he knew how much his small acts of generosity meant to me, but they helped save my humanity because I was becoming increasingly filled with hatred and hardness. I became tough like an animal in many respects, but there was still a human heart underneath that might have been forever poisoned with hatred for all things German or all things period. Not long after, I, after meeting Martin Fuss, I met a German woman who became like a mother to me. She offered me compassion above and beyond anything I could ever have imagined possible at the time. She became my soul's protector. Agnes Reich was a stout woman with a kind face and warm and happy eyes. She was a farmer's wife. One day she was carrying packages and walking back from the bakery pushing her bike. I stepped out in front of her asking if she could spare a small piece of bread. I spoke some German by this time. She looked at me with horror. As I again reflect upon these events so many years later, I wonder what was so different about her heart that she could not ignore me like so many others. I, I was emaciated, bones protruding all over my body. I don't think I had seen my own reflection since leaving my hometown in Hungary, but I must have looked awful. Full of disbelief while trying to reconcile the voice and image standing before her, she said, little boy, why are you here? I pointed to my prisoner number. Oh, you cannot be a political prisoner. With just one glance, she seemed to grasp the essence of the crimes being committed in her country, almost as if we had been going through this together. Through all the hatred for the Jews, though all the hatred for the Jews was clearly visible to her in my emaciated body, she chose not to look away. She was determined to counteract that hatred. She then dug into her bag and handed me a large piece of bread, bigger than any slice of bread I'd ever seen in a concentration camp. For Germans, it was a rationing system, and she gave me half her family's ration of bread, a food coupon and money, so I could shop at the bakery on my own. Her simple act of kindness and compassion forever changed me. From then on, I always looked for Frau Riesch. I told her my name was Lazarus. She always addressed me, my dear son, Lazarus. She actually called me her son. During those summer months when I was at Alak, we met on a weekly basis. And so that's just a little, a little blurb of a story. And um, interestingly, or tragically, Agnes's husband was killed by, um, by people who had been liberated from concentration camps right at the end of the war. And he was just happened to be riding his bike past and he was caught by a mob and killed for no reason, you know, other than he was German. Um, and, and here, uh, his wife had been helping Leslie all this time. Uh, so it's really uh, a very unusual story. But Le Leslie's whole life was to try to find these people who helped him and to thank them. And that's really, I think, where all his healing came from. So um, th th it's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing. But there was another woman who helped him, and he never learned that woman's name. And he spent like 50 years trying to find out who she was. He finally found out who she was. Uh, she was long since passed away, but he met her family. And so things like that he never forgot. And I think that's what planted the seeds in him that he – never had hatred for anyone, no matter what. It's as bad as what was done to him, and he was tortured and all kinds of things that, that you know. Um, he always had this very unusual 
personality of wanting to step back and observe things without trying to judge them, which is a very rare and unusual quality that I don't think very many of us could ever have, especially when things are done to us. But he, he, he could never understand why. He want, why did the, the German people go crazy? Why did this happen? How could they have allowed Hitler to rise like that? And it's something that he always thought about. And um, he was very concerned with the future and not wanting to have any more such things happen. And so he gave everything he had to those kids in Germany, and they, they loved him, and, and um, you know, they gave him love, and they cried with him, and, and that really helped him. Because uh, he had the most healing of anybody from the war that I knew um, because of his experiences. And um, he also spoke at many, many colleges in the United States. He came to Brookdale three times. I had him come back to our center. And um, everywhere he went, it was a packed house and always a lot of tears and a lot of hugs. And, you know, because um, that's just, just what he was about. He, he was... Uh, a uh, really extraordinary, extraordinary person. Uh, there we are together. Uh, and for about 10 years, he called me up, you know, two, three times a day. I never even figured out how he got my number the first time, my cell phone. But uh, he called me up one Sunday morning, and he said, I like that story you wrote about me. And, you know, why don't you come into New York? We'll have lunch together, uh, talk to me. And, uh, and he couldn't go anywhere without people coming up to him. In New York, wherever we were, we went to the United Nations. We were invited there many times to the Hungarian consulate and the German consulate. And he couldn't go anywhere without people stopping him, talking to him. Uh, he was really like a, like a rock star. He really was. Uh, so um, I'd like to think that if I helped him at all, I helped him to find his voice. Because when he started out, he didn't like to talk in front of people. He's another one, right? For 60 years, he kept his mouth shut, or 50 years, whatever it was. Never said a word, never said a word to his family. Uh, and in fact, when he came to this country, uh, his uncle in Los Angeles said, now listen, whatever happened to you, you just forget about it. And he was 17 at the time. He said, just shut up. Don't talk about it. Don't ever think about it. Just let it go. No one here wants to hear about that. So he just sucked it up, and he never talked about it all those years until he got older, until he met me, right? I, I'm always dragging stories out of people, but we, we wrote a book together. We, we did, he did so many speeches at Holocaust memorials all over Europe. Uh, it was really pr maybe the best 10 years of my life was working with him uh, because I just, you know, I don't get to meet people like that every day. Um, and I have a little clip of Leslie. Again, this is, again, sort of who he was. 2154 I want to go to. So let's try to go there. We'll have to sit through the commercial, I guess, for something. Um, but this was kind of like the essence of who he was. Anybody in the world who was good, he wanted to thank them. He wanted to tell them, you know. Uh, all right, let me go to 21... 54, if I can find it. That's probably close enough. Um, now, in this particular case, he had been invited to Mississippi to speak down there. And this is a beautiful little scene where he meets a, a, a veteran of the Army who, was, who had liberated camps where he was. So th but this is who Leslie was. Anybody who ever th helped him, he wanted to find them and thank them and tell them he loved them. so-called Negro Paul 
to the displaced person camp. It's called the DP camp. Yes. Displaced. And they brought us food and, you know, the usual. Yeah. I couldn't believe it, the kindness. Uh, you know, it was something new to me as a kid. Yeah. And unfortunately, when I came to the U.S. and to witness what was going on here, yeah. I could not believe it. Yeah. I said, how is this possible? These men gave their lives and fought along with their white so-called friends. And yet, Thank you. and yet to be so hostile. That was very difficult for me to live with. Well, let me turn back to compassion of other folks. Yeah. By your communion, I don't brown and or black, whatever you want to say. You know? No. I see, I try to be true or I, I, see, I see a wonderful human being in front of me. Yeah. Okay. You know, that never, never came to my mind. <laughs> to me, it's the kindness and the care. Yeah, that's the way I look at it. And that's what I experienced mm -hmm. as a young kid. And it was so important for me to receive this love. Mm -hmm. I lost everybody. You know, I was an orphan. And, uh, what, what, excuse me, what do you mean you lost everybody? I, I oh, actually got to my, know. My family was killed. Oh. You've been through a whole lot. But always upbeat. You know, otherwise you go nuts. That's what you want to know. And I'm happy I met you. Mm -hmm. I came here from Florida mm -hmm. to see you. It took me a few weeks out of the when I said, really, it never made a difference. But it doesn't make a difference. But I don't know. <laughs> I know it was one. Okay, so what happened to this? My technology is failing me here. There we go. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. So, um, yeah, that was sort of the spirit of Leslie. Anywhere he went, he, you know, kind of created that love, you know, and being thankful. So to circle back, I'm sort of getting to the end. I, I, I saved a little time for questions, and so I hope we can have some questions and comments. Um, as I said, my dad died pretty young, died in the 60s, and we didn't really talk much about the war. But I did find an occasional few things that he wrote. Uh, one was an essay that he wrote for a college English class, which was about uh, the t as soon as he came back, he, he, he got his high school GED, and then he went to Seton Hall College at the time. And he wrote about white crosses in the Pacific. That was like a theme of his, because in those days, you know, usually people who died overseas, they were left overseas, they were buried overseas. It's not like today, usually if we have a war today, they bring them home. Um, and, I, and I was told a couple weeks ago we had a program about Marine Raiders, and the guy, the gentleman, uh, Ben, told me that they have actually taken some of those Marines back and buried them at Arlington. But for the most part, you saw these cemeteries, like in the islands where my dad fought, where you know um, they were buried wherever they, wherever they were killed, um, and you just see these services. These are actual photos from. This was sent to me from a friend in Australia, uh, named Pete, and he is a real Guadalcanal expert. He has so much stuff, but they would have these ceremonies and services, and right out in the in the middle there, and. Um, there was one 
Marine chaplain. Uh, he was a Navy chaplain, but he was with the Marines that my dad, where my dad was. And he, he did over 3,000 last rites uh, during the war, over 3,000. And he said some of them were Catholic and some of them were Protestant and some of them were Jewish and some of them were, you know, every religion you can think of. He said, I don't care what religion they were, but, you know, uh, he, he did this, these, these services for them. But could you imagine doing last rites for 3,000 people in the span of a couple of years? Um, you know, uh, his, fa his name was uh, Father Paul Redmond, and he was with the Navy, but he was with the Marine Raiders. Um, so this is kind of a, a common remembrance that they have. Um, and that's today, there's still a chapel out Guadalcanal. Um, and it was something that made an impression on my dad. So on January 10th, he had to write a college essay. And the, the, the subject was, write about a time you're outside of the United States. Um, which, because there were a lot of veterans at the time um, in college then. So that was a good topic, right, to write about. So uh, again, all these cemeteries, and he had this little a little ex excerpt from his essay, uh, which is something he always thought about, for those that remain. So by remain, he means the ones who were buried there. I hope, as well as millions of others hope, that they did not die in vain for an unknown cause. I hope when the world learns to live together in peace, that they will remember white crosses in the Pacific of very courageous Americans who left their wives, mothers, and sweethearts only never to return, so that we may go on living together in harmony, like a giant baton leading a world symphony in the music of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So this was something that a lot of those veterans thought about um, because, you know, and, and Leslie said this too a lot. Uh, I'm just looking for something real quick if I can find it. Um, I just want to mention one other thing. But Leslie said this a lot, that he had just hoped that all these things that happened, you know, would never happen again. And, uh, you know, I don't think uh, necessarily that the world has done a good job since World War II with uh, not having conflicts, but that's probably a talk for another lecture some other day. Um, but this is what a lot of these, these people thought about, um, uh, because they just, um, I mean, the last time we had a president Right, the only the only World War II president was John F. Kennedy, right, who had seen combat and been been wounded in, in combat. So it's a diff it's a different kind of a political leader you get when they have some awareness of war rather than uh, the ones who are so eager to send people over there, um, and, and, you know. And so this was something that really stuck in. in I know this is my, something that stuck in my dad's mind. So. Um, you know, I, I never got to really hear all of his stories, but uh, I think that, you know, um, thanks to my mom, it was the reason I went on this journey, why I ever uh, came here to teach and became part of the World War II Center, and all that happened from just knowing that something happened, and, you know, I didn't know what it was, and, and it was something that I should find out about. So I would love to hear if there's any questions or comments. Uh, there is a microphone up there too, but I don't know if you feel like walking up there. You can get, they'll get good sound though. Um, is Caitlin around somewhere? Caitlin, maybe even if you want, you could bring the microphone over to people if they're raising their hand. But uh, if, yeah, yeah, well. You can give that to him. Yeah. That's all right. A lot more operational in terms of what was happening on front lines. But, but anybody who's kind of interested in, in, in kind of seeing day to day, read Ellie Wiesel and Knight. Yeah, Ellie Wiesel and Leslie were good friends, actually. And a funny story, I mentioned the, the lady, uh, Helena Kusten Jagendorf, who was a partisan when she was just a teenager, fighting the Nazis in the, in the, in the jungles, you know, like a, like a guerrilla warfare. And Leslie and Elie Wiesel 
when they came back, they were competing for Helena's affections. And she didn't want anything to do with either one of them <laughs> in a romantic sense. Uh, Leslie remained her friend, uh, but she didn't want anything to do with either one of them. So she could have had a Nobel Prize winner right on one side, and then, uh, but um, they were both competing for her affections uh, when she first came to this country. Uh, so, yeah, but. Yeah, of course, of course. I'd love to hear more comments and questions. Does anybody have any questions? Caitlin will bring the microphone over to you. You can be on the film. This gentleman back here, I guess, has one. He's right here, Caitlin. Yeah, I always like to leave time for questions, so no one has any questions? Over here in the front. Out how yeah, you can take the mic. It helps better for, for our recording. <laughs> the cheap seats. Um, I was curious to know why the American authorities would have uh, suggested that he renounce his American citizenship in order to gain his freedom from an American internment camp. You would think they would have asked him to renounce his Japanese citizenship to do so. Well, that's a long story, and, and there's a lot of little twists and turns in there. Um, but there was a lot of uh, political stuff going on, and I think they wanted to just get rid of them. I think they wanted a lot of them to leave eventually, leave the country. Um, and he didn't really know what he was doing when he signed those papers, but he, he basically signed away his citizenship. But it, it was it was not held up in court years later. So technically he always was an American citizen, but he thought he had renounced his citizenship and he thought he'd lost it. But it was, um, it was, it was actually not, not valid in court. I think there's a question back there. Um, but it set him on a long, a long road in his life of just sort of having no, no attachments and no roots and not being able to build a life like everybody else. Question in the back. Several several times you talked about your website. Could you tell us what your website is? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I can show it to you here. It's, uh, there's a couple things I wanted to show you. Um, the website is called thetigerisdead.com. And if you go there, I have a lot of interviews with Marines and other people. Uh, if you wanted to download my book, you can download the book. Um, and I have mostly a lot of stories about Bob. So uh, basically throughout his whole life, I have photos and different things. And Bob, uh, it's mostly fake focus on Bob, but I have a lot of other veterans in in interviews there. So a lot of Marines from Guadalcanal. And um, I have a nurse, Mildred Murphy. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely check that out. And uh, I think you'll find it's... Uh, there's a lot of stuff. The other thing I wanted to share real quick, we have a new exhibit in the World War II Center uh, in the library. If you're ever passing by, we have some of the, some things from Ken, Kenneth Johnson, who uh, was a, a paratrooper during World War II. And um, we have a nice interview with him that was recovered. It's up on the Brookdale website. Uh, he's interviewed by Paul Frisco. Uh, and, uh, and I mentioned that uh, Paul Frisco is wearing the darker shirt. Uh, all the volunteers over the years at the World War II Center. Paul Frisco was one of the best we ever had. I, I heard that he recently passed away, and I didn't even know this. Um, we're going to have to do something to honor him. But he conducted all these interviews of veterans long before I ever did, uh, the, the Triumphant Spirit series, and you can find that on the Brookdale website. But we noticed that Ken, Ken Johnson, his, his interview wasn't there, so I had to find it, and we got it put up here. And I have his whole story here as well, of, of his whole life story. So, and if you go into the library, if you go to our World War II Center, you'll see some of his stuff, his jump boots, his jump jacket, the flag. 
Uh, it, it's really, really interesting stuff. And that we, we were watching this interview. I was watching it with his daughter and his grandson before. Um, and see, this is a good example of, you know, what was so great about doing this work all these years, that you get to be around people like this. When you see that interview and you just, and, and I was talking with his grandson, uh, he may or may not want to say anything, but I was talking with his grandson. I said, you know, they don't make people like this anymore. Can you imagine today, uh, God forbid, you know, we, we should ever have to do something with the, 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 the level of World War II, and we'd never be able to do it. Because in this day, the, the, the people had such a sense of service to their country. And, and it's just, it's very rare today. Of course, the program I did a couple weeks ago, um, I had Ben Wilson, who was, a, he was a, a former Marine, and he's a historian now, who did a program on the Marine Raiders. And I thought, he, he's one of those people, too, who devoted his whole life to service. You know, he did three tours of duty over, over in the wars. And um, so I said, he, I said to him, you know, you would probably fit in just fine in the World War II generation. But most of us today, we don't have this kind of spirit. And if you watch that interview, you'll just get a, a sense that they just uh, took everything on and they just did it and they didn't complain about things. And they were just, they just had this idea of service, you know, like, this is what you do. You give something to your country. You give something. You, you gotta, you gotta help out. And, and I just think that that that's the, been the best thing about all this. When I got to meet people and meet veterans and meet their families, because the families of veterans too give up an incredible amount of sacrifice. They do a lot of sacrifices, and that's something that's hardly ever talked about. Uh, the spouses of veterans and the, and the children, and they they give up a lot too. Uh, in, in different ways, but when you when you get to be around people like that, and you see that there were people like that, uh, it's just it just it just makes you feel good because you just think, you know, how could people have been so good? You know, how could people have been so selfless? Um, and he Ken Ken Johnson is one of those people. You can tell when you see that interview, you're going to feel that way. So if you, if you go past the library, you want to see his stuff. Uh, the boots that he wore, you know, on D-Day or the, day, the night before, actually. Um, if you want to see some of that stuff, it's there, and it's really, it's really interesting. But these two, Paul Frisco as well, he gave so much. He did so many of those interviews. Uh, and we have a lot of stuff on our website if you ever want to check it out. We have the complete Al Meserlin gal gallery, which is all the photographs. Al Meserlin was a Jersey guy, and he was Eisenhower's photographer. And if you go into the lobby of the library, you'll see a lot of these photographs are there. Um, I think we have the whole thing. Wh whatever we don't have, uh, whatever we don't have in the library, we have on the website. Um, nice high def pictures. So they're somewhere here, but uh, you can scroll and find them yourself. I'm kind of scrambling around here for some reason, but uh, I but have, uh, I have an another question and then some comments. Sure. Um, I was wondering, uh, you're, you're talking about, is there a World War II lo physical location on the campus, and is it in the library? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you go into the library, the main entrance of the library, I think it's the only entrance now, uh, if you go in and you just bear a little bit to the, to the uh, left, you'll see World War II Center. And we have a lot of stuff in there. We have newspapers from World War II. We have some exhibits. We've got a lot of, a lot of stuff in there, so, uh, and a lot of books, too. Uh, so if you're ever interested, you can kind of go in there. And usually, it's, Caitlin is working there now. Usually, sh somebody will be there, and they can kind of help you find what you're looking for. And if you can't find what you're looking for, we can, we can look for it. But, but we have a lot of stuff in there. So these, these Meserlin photographs are pretty extraordinary. So. Uh, you, you can check that out too, and we and we have a lot of those Meslin photographs in the lobby of the library. Uh, they're up, so um, I would tell you to certainly go and check that out. Um, also, um, did you say that this is being recorded? Is it possible to put the recording on the website? Yeah, this this recording will be on the Brookdale YouTube channel. You know, probably in a couple weeks or so. I don't know exactly when. Okay, it, it, but is it possible to? To put it on the uh, the Brookdale, uh, you know your your website. In other words, the the Brookdale World War II Center website. 
Well, yeah, yeah, we could we could do a link, I'm sure. Yeah, but Brookdale has a YouTube channel um, where where they have a lot of their stuff too. But that's a good idea. Yeah, we'll we'll put a link up there for sure. Okay, and um, so just a couple of comments while you were going through the uh, you know the the talk, and I kind of looked some things up, and it, it seems I think that is the name of that feature film. That about Leslie Schwartz called Lazarus? No, it's not called Lazarus. It's, um... Okay, that's what I thought it said. Oh, gosh, why can't I think of that? If, if we'll get another question. I'll get, I'll get it for you. Oh, one one other thing also. I think that the first uh, George Bush was a, a, a president who did serve in World War II also. The f yeah, uh, his father, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, can we get the mic back? The name of the movie was The Samuel Project. The Samuel Project. And the other film was The Muldorf Train of Death. Um, although I don't know that you can find that anywhere. It's a, it was on Bavarian television. So I, I haven't seen it streaming. But the other one you can find, The Samuel Project, that was based on, on Leslie's life. Yeah. A question about D-Day uh, with the fortifications that the Nazis had built there were significant and for us to win that battle uh, the paratroopers had to do something pretty amazing the night before to go in and cause disruption uh, attack them from the rear hold bridges and roads and uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on that well yeah we, we've done a, a, no, a number of programs and the, like the last one we had was John Santillo who was in that invasion and um, I mean, it's just again, it's one of these stories like we were saying before with your with your grandfather. You just I just wonder how in the world were they ever able to do this? And it just kind of blows my mind, honestly. Uh, the same thing can be said for Guadalcanal, you know, where my dad was. There was maybe like uh, 15,000 Marines and over 30,000 Japanese at different times, almost up to 40,000 were landing on. I mean, I, I don't know how they were able to do these things. So it's just, it, it blows my mind when I hear stories like that. And again, if you want to see an incredible story, watch the interview with his grandfather um, on, our, on the Brookdale site there. It, it's just like, you just think, how could they, how could they do this? How could they survive this? Uh, but the whole thing is, is mystifying to me. Uh, it really is. I, I don't have any answers, but uh, like we were saying before, like if, we be if you believe in God, I mean, I don't know, was God was on our side? I, I don't know what to tell you. I do believe in God, so maybe, but it's, it's, it's hard to explain these things. It really is in any kind of a, a rational way. Um, was there another question somewhere? Oh, she's getting it? Okay. Because um, I often think of, and there's a question in the back too. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to everyone. Because uh, I often thought about that, like, you know, with what my dad went through. They had malaria. They had dysentery. Of course, he also had, uh, you know, concussions and brain injury. And, um, you know, uh, they're sitting in water, you know, up to their waist because they're in a foxhole and they're being bombed at the same time. And it's just like it just it blows your mind, really, when you try to when you try to think about it. Question in the back some comments. Um, uh, this has brought up so many thoughts and emotions for me because I was born in Lithuania during the war and uh, when the Soviet communists invaded and then uh, the Nazis divided part of Lithuania into Germany. My, uh, my father, we were at that point, my family was living in the German side of Lithuania, he was conscripted and sent to the Russian front, and he was killed there when I was four years old. I never saw him. And uh, my mother's oldest brother had been the last interior uh, prime minister of independent Lithuania at the time, and eventually, and he apparently had sought out to America for help, and none came. And um, he, they, 
communist, Soviet communist ordered him to Moscow where they shot him. So the background of my family is just incredible. And my, that left my mother with four children and she was in her late 30s. I mean, talking about doing the incredible, she, she and my uh, paternal grandmother and aunt and uncle uh, escaped what they, I thought, think, thought that it was going to be safe to be in Germany. But I, I had nightmares for years. I was about four at that point. We traveled by horse and wagon on dirt-covered roads with thousands and thousands of other refuges without homes. And um, uh, we lived in one of those DP's camps for about five years while my mother went around to the different uh, counselors to get us out of war-torn uh, Europe for freedom. And we eventually, and I do believe in God, and I believe uh, it was a Methodist church in Richmond, Virginia that became our sponsors. And uh, so in 1951, we uh, went and lived in uh, Richmond, Virginia, you know, and there's more. And my mother, uh, uh, she went to work in the factory to support us. And my oldest brother stopped high school and went into construction. He became, uh, you know, like the husband and father to us. Uh, and my family has suffered tremendous and uh, tremendous. And so when I read about your lecture and how it affects, you know, each of us, I'm still searching that out. And seeing Leslie's story about the compassion, uh, uh, you know, to the different German people who offered the piece of the bread, the this, I see I need a lot of healing still. And, and what uh, really resonated with me too was, you know, somewhere you mentioned about telling my story. I want to tell my story because my children and grandchildren, they don't understand. I, I was just gonna say, I think you should write a book. But I um, need help. Uh, is, uh, uh, Come to my creative help? writing class. I'll, I'll get you started. I've gotten a lot of people started. Oh, thank you. Thank sure, you. I'll give you my card. Don't leave at the end. I'll give you my thank card. Thank you so much. But All I right. mean, you know, when you hear stories like that, you just wonder how, how in the world did they survive all this? Uh, it's just, um, you know, the, the, the things that people go through. Um, and and, and, and to, to your point, uh, what, what, with, with all that I've studied and researched, I mean, it's oh, the people who are always affected the worst by a war are always the civilians in the country, women, children, old people, you know, uh, the environment. You know, th that's always the biggest casualties of any war. Um, it may be fought with by, you know, soldiers and, and, and warriors and whatnot, but it's always the people who live in these countries who, who always have to deal with the terrible aspects of it, like we could see now in, in, in Ukraine. It, it's, you know, it, it's always so much bigger than just the, the, the war. And that's why I hate, you know, I hate war to this day. I got that from my father. And, and I don't understand how any politician anywhere in the world should be allowed to stay in office if they don't prevent a war. If they start a war in any country, I don't care what the reason is, they shouldn't be allowed to be in office because their only job should be to pre prevent war. That yeah. should be their main first thing, and, and they just, you know, it just doesn't end. So I don't want to go off on a whole uh, soapbox here, but it really, you know, because all the things you were just describing, you know, how many millions and millions and millions of families have gone through things like that and are still going through it today. So what do you do if you're in Ukraine? You're just a person, you, you have a family, your kids are going to school, whatever, you're going to the grocery store one minute and the next minute bombs are going off uh, because of some greater geopolitical thing. You know, it, it just doesn't, it, it shouldn't be allowed anymore. We, we, we know too much 
to allow this. But that's a, a lot of those veterans, Bob, especially Bob Worthington, that was his, his big thing. You know, they should know what war is. They wouldn't fight wars if they knew what it was. But this is something that we are really slow learners, the human race. But, but I would personally, any politician who starts a war, they got to be out the next day because they failed. Uh, that's just my opinion, but uh, you didn't ask for that. So let's see if there's any more questions. Uh, we'll be wrapping up in a couple minutes. Anybody else with a question or a comment? So we have a lot of resources that I, I'd love people to take advantage of. Um, you know, the center will be will continue even if I'm not the director uh, next semester. It'll still be going on. There's a lot of stuff that you can sink your teeth into. So come on over and say hello. And, and you know, um, it really, it's it, 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 the, the main thing for us to do is let's just remember. Let's never forget. What, what all these people did and what they went through. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And please feel free to hang around, introduce yourselves. And we, you had a little survey, I think, about, you know, like a uh, review. So if you did that, you can just leave it. We'll pick it up. And uh, thank you all.